So good morning, everyone. Okay, and welcome to Area 41. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you this week. And I think the conference people are doing a very good job. So let's see what we are going to cover next. My name is Raul Silis. I came from Spain, as you can say, from my accent. And I do information security. Okay, I founded a small uh, company called Dinoseg, and we have been doing interesting stuff there for years. Okay? So what we're going to do in the next 50 minutes is to go through a Hollywood movie or a series of movies in reality to explain you some current state of the art of vulnerability research and, and markets. Okay? We are going to see also uh, what is the, for you to understand, the current business Apple has okay, on the market, a specific feature that they implemented in the mobile devices, and we are going to see if it is vulnerable or not, and if we can manipulate it somehow, going into the details of the different attacks, and then some conclusions at the, at the end. So starting with the vulnerability research markets, uh, the first thing I want you to think about is uh, what is the impact in the society of the things we as researchers found, okay? the vulnerabilities we found in different technologies. Okay? Because more and more we are trusting technology and therefore it's going to impact our society. So think, think about it. Okay? Then, if you find something interesting, who is going to buy that? Okay, and, and what they are going to do with it. So regarding who is going to buy it, it's typically closed groups, could be cyber criminal, could be the different brokers or vulnerability markets that are available. Okay, and there you are going to find government, security private companies, other entities, other people there. Regarding what is going to be used for, Think about it. It can be used to attack all the vulnerable systems that are affected by that vulnerability without people knowing about it. Because if it is not even a zero day, it's a known unknown, no, no one's know about it, they cannot easily defend against it too. So the best option is to assume you are compromised. Basically because you need to be aware that there are people that know about vulnerabilities you don't know about that affect your systems. So that's a reality. There is a couple of good papers that Stefan was presenting yesterday about them, okay, that I recommend you to take a look at regarding this perspective. Uh, so as a researcher, from a disclosure point of view, what can you do? You have multiple options. So the first one is what we called in the past, and we will be back to that, responsible disclosure. The problem is that responsible depends on uh, the responsibility of the vendor, the responsibility of the researcher, and the level of responsibility of each of them, which typically is not the same. So we will go back to it. You can do nothing. Basically, you can say, OK, I'm going to keep the vulnerability for myself. I'm not going to publish it. And I will serve the community. But this is like the uh, scary movies from, from the US, OK? Like uh, Scream and all that movies, that you know that the bad guy is going to come after you anywhere. Okay. No matter what you do, at the end they came back, come back to you. So be careful with that option. Okay? The second one is what now we call coordinated disclosure and not responsible disclosure anymore because responsibility is not very clear. Coordinated means you coordinate as a researcher with the vendor. Okay? That's the, the point. And typically, researchers look for some kind of compensation okay? just to pay the burgers. That's fine. Okay. As it was mentioned yesterday, the researcher needs to think about, do I want to pay the mortgage of my house or do I want a t-shirt? Okay. Sometimes you even need to build up your t-shirts because you don't even get a t-shirt. Okay. Or you can go to full disclosure. Full disclosure is there to motivate somehow the vendors. Okay. That's the idea. So final option, you can sell it through the back bounty program or through uh, any of the brokers or vulnerability purchase programs, okay, in order to get some, some money. The other option is to publish the vulnerability in a conference. It could be called conference disclosure or something like that. So regarding vulnerability research, in the past, I followed responsible or coordinated disclosure with the vendors, okay, and they released an advisory and that was fine. But this time, I wanted to research some of those vulnerability programs and the markets. And the vulnerability got accepted in one of the programs, was there, 
no one was very interested in it. What I learned is that mainly these programs are focused on remote code execution, local privilege escalation, or some kind of memory disclosure to exploit the other two. So this is their main interest, okay? It's a vulnerability I found at the end of, sorry, at the beginning of 2012, so about two and a half years ago, okay? And it's difficult to give it private and to know if it is still valid and, it, and, and if it is still working, okay? And we will go deeper into that afterwards, okay, with a, a few details. As far as I know, it was kept private till I disclosed it two months ago at Ruticon. But I don't know if you are aware of that, but in Spain we had a, a huge controversy during the last two, three years because they were going to build a very big casino gaming center there for Europe in Madrid. So I figured out that Madrid is like Vegas. What happens in Madrid stays in Madrid. And no one's know about what we present there. So it was a very good opportunity to come here for the first anniversary of, a, okay, of Area 41 instead of Hash Days and present that to you. So all the things you need to think about when you find something is, uh, what if the bend someone finds it? What if the vendors fix it? Okay, there are different scenarios where your vulnerability will lose value because it has been fixed or is not valid anymore. That's the, the idea. Okay? So let's jump into the disclosure process. From the past, I learned that some vendors do not take seriously some security issues we found. Okay? We have multiple examples of that. So what I did, like three months ago, is through Twitter, I asked the community, I asked, okay, what do you think should be the period where a researcher notifies a vendor okay, about a vulnerability if the vendor doesn't have any bug bounty program or any other uh, program in, in place like that? And I got multiple responses, okay? People saying it depends a lot on the vendor, the researcher, the complexity, the scope, the impact, okay? The relationship that the vendor maintains with the researcher with updates about the vulnerability, lots of different aspects. So what I decided somehow to show up the immaturity of our industry is that I created a new, okay, policy. Because I figured out that policies are, I mean, disclosure policies, are like assholes, everyone has one, okay? So I created the month and a day rule, okay? Similar to the common law sentences, one month and a day before you're going to publish it, you notify the vendor. Why? Because you can do it. Okay, basically, we are very immature yet, even in these kind of things, okay? We don't agree on a common policy. So the vulnerability was notified to Apple on February 6th, okay? Before I was going to, to present there. Okay, before we go deeper into the vulnerability, let's jump into the Apple business so that you understand what could be the impact of the vulnerability and why some technical stuff that is already built there is there, okay? What is the purpose of it? So basically, uh, Apple, as you know, has a very big business based on hardware, software, services, contents, a lot of stuff. And to give you an idea, they made like $60 billion of revenue on the last quarter. 4.4 billion are related to contents, iTunes software, okay? And in total, cumulative, okay, they have made, made 65 billion, okay, in apps, iOS, iPhone, and iPad apps, okay, paying 15 billion to developers, okay? And we have around 1, bill, 1 million apps already available in the market. So big numbers there, okay? This is how the apple, or the golden apple, looks like, probably, okay? So, apart from that, Apple implements, or has an extensive program regarding businesses. That is, how you can use iPhone, iPad, so on and so forth, in your business, with different documents. I recommend you to take a look. They updated it on last February, the security de details, okay, of the iOS platforms, and it's an interesting document, okay? And we are going to focus on a very specific feature that is implemented on the devices, and it's called the System Software Authorization. So what's that? This is a system, okay, it's a module that is available on iOS devices to prevent downgrades, the option of you installing a previous iOS version. So because we know previous versions could have vulnerabilities, okay, 
we don't want people to exploit it. But the Apple message is this one, is an attacker who gains possession of a device, a mobile device, could install an older version of iOS and exploit it, a vulnerability there to take advantage of that. Are you worried about that from a business perspective? For those of you that have played with Apple devices and have downgraded them or changed the firmware version, what happens when you change the firmware version? Especially if you downgrade or reinstall the firmware. What happens with the user data? It's removed. So I'm not concerned about someone finding my phone and downgrading it because my data is not going to be there. What is the problem with that? With downgrading. What it allows to the community? Jailbreak the devices. Basically take full control of the devices and break the Apple business model because people can parade apps, so on and so forth. So be careful with the messages you get from the vendors. Now the updates can be done over the air, OTA, okay? And basically what the device is going to do is, it, you want to update the device, it's going to connect to the Apple installation authorization server, and it's going to generate some measurements, crypto measurements about the different elements involved in the firmware you are going to push there. The, the low-level bootloader, the kernel, the image, iBoot, all the different components are crypto evaluated and you generate some hashes about that. Okay? What do you do next? Then you're going to submit those hashes to the Apple authentication server, but the server only allows you to install the latest version. When a new version is released, they have a very narrow window when they allow both versions, the previous one and the new one, and then only they allow the, the new one based on the device you have. Okay? That's the, the overall idea. This signing process is based on the version you want to install, your unique ID for your Apple device, and announce a random string. Okay? We're going to see why uh, we have three, these three different elements. These capabilities were implemented from iOS 3 around iPhone 3G, 3GS, okay? so a long time ago, but originally they only were implemented without the nonce, so only with the firmware and the unique ID. So what people did was, okay, let me take my firmware, let me take my unique ID, submit that to Apple, get a signature, and what can I do? I can reuse the same signature for future downgrades, because it's the same device, same ID, same firmware I want to return back to. So Apple figure out that, and what they introduce is the uh, nonce. Okay, it's a random value that is per restore. So you cannot reuse a previous signature okay, because it was signed for a nonce that is different from the one you are trying now. It's the method they introduced in iOS 5. Okay? So these signatures are called SHSH blobs. Okay? It, came from, it comes from signature hashes, basically. Okay? And there has been a lot of research, especially in the jailbreak, CDA community with different tools that allow you to, uh, or provide you capabilities to be able to downgrade the device if you store these previous blobs when you didn't have the nonce, okay, as we have, we have covered. You have multiple details available. These blobs are basically someone hashes. So let's recap the process. Basically what we do is we want to uh, install a new firmware on the iOS device. We go to Apple server. I mean, we calculate some measurements, crypto measurements for the different elements associated to the firmware we want to install. We go to Apple. The Apple server says, okay, you are running or you have an iPhone 5. Okay, you want to install iOS 711. Therefore, I'm now sing signing this version for this device. It is going to return you the SHSH blobs, basically a signature that validates the updating process and you can update the device. That's the idea. The nonce that was introduced is what we call the AP ticket. Okay? It's what made some possible to be able to restore pre I mean, previous versions with your previous SHSH blobs because the blobs will change every time you try to update or restore the device. That's the idea. Okay, there was a period where it was possible to downgrade devices. 
okay? And the different options are available there on the slide. Basically, it is based on let's put the device on a very old version, iOS 3, for example, where there was no nonce, and therefore I can reuse my blobs. Or let's exploit the vulnerability. For example, all the A4-based devices, Apple devices, are vulnerable to the Limerain boot ROM exploit, so you can exploit that to downgrade the device. Or otherwise, you are pretty much limited. Okay? We can say that since iOS 6, around April last year, okay, you cannot easily downgrade the newer devices. It's the situation we have right now. Okay? In any case, you need to save your previous blobs in case you need or you have an opportunity to downgrade the device in the future. You don't know, so it's a good practice to save them, just in case. If you want to check what versions are supported by which devices, okay, and all the compatibility issues, I recommend you to take a look at the iOS support matrix, okay? So the next question is, without a boot ROM exploit, like the one we have for the A4 devices, can we somehow manipulate this update process and do something with it? So let's take a look at it. A very significant change we, Apple, introduced in iOS 5 was wireless capabilities. In the past, you couldn't use wireless, for example, to update the device, but they introduced over-the-air updates. So what people are doing is they are using more and more wireless capabilities, Wi-Fi, 3G, so on and so forth, instead of the USB cables, and they are using that to update the device. So you can go to settings, general, software update, okay? You can use that also to sync or back up your data, okay, wirelessly through iTunes. So in order to do that, you go to uh, settings general, okay, iTunes Wi-Fi sync. You need to enable that first on iTunes, the first time you connect that through USB, or even you can do backups wirelessly in iCloud, okay? So multiple options. People are getting used to this. I started, uh, when I was doing the research to analyze the update process, and what I discovered is that the mobile devices from Apple connect to the Apple server through HTTP instead of HTTPS. So it's a good beginning for the researcher you know, to be able to manipulate and know what's going on there. In particular, they connect to mesu.apple.com. This is the update checking server, okay? And this is done automatically by the device or the user can manually force uh, an update check and see if there is a new update, okay? As a result, what you're going to get is a plist file, you know, XML file, with all the current iOS versions and all the pointers and descriptions regarding each version. The different pointers are going to point to the download server. This is from where you get the new firmwares, okay? Which are zip files in reality. Okay, so where this file that contains the new updates is located. Basically, it's in the Mesu server, and it's called com apple mobile asset software update. There is a similar documentation file with documentation about the latest updates, okay? And the first ones that were offered over the air using this method were the ones associated to iOS 5.01, okay? Some 5 betas also had them, but the, the first official public one was 5.01. So let's see how it works, how in iOS 5 and 6 we can update our devices. So first of all, what the device is going to do is going to send a head request, okay? Surprisingly, in iOS 5, the user agent uh, has an, an initialized variable, so basically it was wrong, and in iOS 6, they, they replace that by the, the, the module that is uh, taking place, or is, uh, uh, carrying the updates, basically. So it's a head request. As a result, you get a response, and the device is going to check the response, and it's going to say, okay, the response has a last modified date, so if my current version, okay, is greater, sorry, let's say that in a different way. If the version I'm getting is greater than the one I, I currently have, I need to update, I need to get the new contents. So basically, this is what the device does. It's going to check that value, it's going to check the value it has stored on the device. If this one is greater, what it's going to do? It's going to submit a get request, okay? It's going to try to get the contents from the Apple server. So you ask for it, and you get the same response 
okay, with the same, obviously, last modifier value, but now you get the contents, and the contents is basically the playlist file we mentioned before with all the different versions available, current versions for the different Apple devices, okay, with, and that's important, a signature. So this file has been signed with digital certificates uh, owned by Apple, okay, and the same process is applied to the documentation file we mentioned before. Okay, so the next question is, can we somehow manipulate this process? What do you think? This is where the DeLorean comes in place. Based on what we have seen, ideas. Change the date somehow. Remember back to the future? What we did is change dates to move to the past, present, or future. So what, what if we change the last modified date in this HTTP exchange? What can we do with it? So let's take a look at that. What do you prefer, Star Wars or Matrix? It's your choice now. Star Wars. How many people go for Star Wars? A few, the older ones, probably. <laughs> Matrix. <laughs> Okay, more people go to for Matrix. Okay, well, so let's see which one is more effective because these are two types of attacks we are going to implement here. So, how, first of all, how can we exploit the vulnerability? Basically, what we can do is launch a man-in-the-middle attack. Okay, we can impersonate a Wi-Fi access point or any other method to stay in the middle between the victim device and the rest of the internet. That's the idea. In order to do that, what I did is I implemented a, a tool Python-based tool called iProxy, okay, that is based on Twisted, probably you know it, it's the one used in SSL Street, for example, it's an event-driven networking uh, library, and surprisingly, okay, Twisted is, a lot, uh, is available on twistedmatrix.com, so the matrix theme was already there, okay, and I implemented both attacks, so let's take a look at both, okay, let's start with the Star Wars, okay, remember the movie, okay, what happened with Obi-Wan? and the Jedi tree. What he did? Basically, when the Imperial soldiers came in, okay, he used the tree to say, okay, this is, these are the droids. So this is what we are going to do with the other devices. We are going to say, we that thing. How can we do that? Very easily. First of all, you can see the head request, and you can think, okay, let's drop the head request so that it doesn't complete. But it doesn't work, because if you block the head request, it's going to ask for a get request, okay? You can block the get request too, but what's going to happen? This is not transparent for the user, for the victim user, because it's going to get a pop-up saying, I cannot check if there are new updates available. So it doesn't work. But what if we do the following? We get the head request, and we say, okay, the last modified header of the response is from two years ago. Basically, don't worry, device. Okay, the last update is from two years ago. You are fine. You have the latest one. Okay? And it seems that that will be okay. That will be fine. So let's take a look at that. Let me show you this one over here, okay, where we have the device. Uh, this device is running 613. You see that it's sending a head request. We let it go through, and we get the response from January, saying the last update is from January 20, okay? Because it's a new one, it asks for a get request, and we get the response saying there is a new one, and here is the content, okay? And it, this one is for version 704, okay? The la latest one at that time, okay? We drop it because we don't want to update the device at this point, so next, what I'm going to show you is that this device is running 613, okay, so an older one, and we are going to play the Star Wars or Jedi trick. So basically, we take iProxy, we tell the tool to implement the Jedi trick, okay, and we can impersonate any version we want, okay? In this case, 613, 613, and we run it. So when the device connects again to check if there are new updates, what we're going to see is that we have the proxy in the middle, so we take burp and point it to iProxy, so that iProxy can manipulate requests and responses, and it's checking for that. And what's going on here? It sends the head request, but now iProxy says, 
don't worry. The latest update is from 2010, okay? That's the Jedi trick, okay? These are not the updates you're looking for. And the device, when we let the response go through and it is received by the device, the device says, okay, I'm fine. 613 is the latest one. Although we know 704 is available there, okay? So let me leave it there. This is for those of you that selected Star Wars. What about, okay, this was my face when I saw that. I said, no, no, it can't be as easy as that, just to manipulate the update process this way, but it is. So what about those of you that selected Matrix? What happened in Matrix, one of the scenes of the movie? Okay, we have Morpheus with both pills, the red and the blue one, saying, okay, if you take the blue pill, okay, you wake up in your bed and you think whatever you want to think. If you take the red one, okay, I will just stay in Wonderland and I will show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Basically, you stay in Apple land and I will show you how deep the update hole goes. Okay, so let's go the Matrix way. Okay, what if I change the last modified header of the head request to the future? So what I'm doing is forcing the device to update. So the device says, is there a new update? And I say, oh, yes, of course, there is one for 2020, okay? Six years from now, okay? We already have that update here. And it's going to ask for the get request, and I could try to modify the response, okay? And put in the response change, for, for, for example, 704 by 511, okay? The problem is, remember, there is an integrity check there because the file is signed by Apple, so you cannot modify that. So what is another option we have? We can use replay attacks because I cannot modify the file. What if I send you a valid file from the past, one I recorded when 511 was available? So basically, this is the Jedi trick. If I send you a file that says, no, the latest one is 511, although we have 704, the device says, okay, everything is fine. So I'm updated. Uh, 511, it is. And not only that, if I provide you a last modified date of the future, saying this is 2025, okay, what is your device going to do? It's going to catch that and think that 511 is the latest update and is valid up to 2025. Okay, so you are inside the matrix now. The amount of time I want you to be there. Basically, you are not going to check for new updates up to 2025. So that's the, the idea. Let's take a look at that in the video, okay, where again we see the device doing the head request. It says 2010, okay, so it's fine. It thinks it's updated. So now we are going to implement the matrix attack, okay? So the device is going to, we are going to change I proxy, okay, from, from the Jedi option to the matrix op option. Basically what this one is going to do is it's going to force the device to look for a new update, saying there is a new one in the future, and it's going to manipulate the get response to provide a response that corresponds to a previous iOS version. That's the, the overall idea. We can even put there whatever date we want, okay? We can manipulate the date as we want and say, okay, the date is 2015 in this case, okay? So there is a new update, okay, uh, that is coming from next year. Basically, that's the, the idea. So we run that, same thing as before. We check that we are going through iProxy, and then we check from the device if there are new updates, it gets or sends the head, now the response says 2020, saying yes, of course, there is a new update coming from the future. Okay? So the device sends the get request, and the response it's going to get is the one we manipulated through iProxy. So it's a valid one. It's valid up to September 2015, but what is the version we are providing there? If, you, if we go to that specific request and response, you can see that what I injected there is a uh, P list file associated to 613, okay? 613 there, instead of 704. So the device thinks that 613 is the latest version up to next year, 2015, and that's it. We remove a proxy, we remove everything, so you now connect to the network without the attacker being 
okay, on the man in the middle position. And as you can see, it sends the head request. It receives the response because it's from 2014. It says, no, no, till 2015, I'm done. So it thinks it's updated. And it will remain there forever till the date we decided it to be there. Okay? So at that point, when I saw that you cannot even that temporarily, but permanently, okay, this was my face. Okay? Obviously, it changed. And I said, no, 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 this cannot be possible. Okay? But remember, I discovered that in 2012, okay? two and a half years ago. In order to be able to launch the attack, basically, you need to collect all these plist files from previous versions. So what I did is I created a repository over the years, collecting all these different files, okay, and the documentation files too, so that you can uh, force a device to be in any version, okay, you want it to be. And uh, I'm releasing today a tool that is a complementary tool I use during the process, and it could be useful for you if you are going to research about iOS updates. I basically call the tool iKamasu, coming from okay, iOS, com, Apple, mobile, asset, software update. Yeah, I'm not very original about the tool names, but okay, it's not my business. And what this tool that I'm releasing today is going to do, by the way, the version, it's available here, okay? It's been released today. The version is 41, because we are in area 41, of course. Okay, and what it allows you to do, it allows you to parse the plist files to extract information from there. So it's a Python-based tool, so it works fine in Windows, Linux, Mac, Mac, okay? As you can see here, it has multiple options, just for you to take a look at it very quickly, because it's not the main purpose of the talk, but just for you to know, you can check the minimum version that is uh, available on the plist file, or the maximum version, or both versions and you, you can get a, okay, a brief summary for the file maximum, minimum, number of devices, assets, and, and versions. You can get an extended summary about the, the file, and you can do other more interesting searches. So you can see, let me see all the iOS versions that are available there. And it's going to classify all the different iOS, iOS versions and the devices that are allowed to go to those versions right now based on the file. And we can do the opposite. We can say, okay, let me, sorry, let me check all the devices and the different iOS versions that are associated to each device. Okay, you can classify by both. Or you can mix things or search things. You can say, okay, let me, for iOS version, let's say 7.1.3, I want to know what devices are supported. Or I want to get more information about those devices. And you can see all the different entries or updates that are available for uh, iOS 6.1.3, in this case, for an, an i4.4, okay? Or even you can get even more details with the full details option, okay, with all the different links to the different zip files and all that. It's an easy way to process the, the update files, okay? Just to give you a, a brief, brief overview of it, okay? It's available for you since this morning, okay? What about iOS 7? When, re remember, I've discovered this in, uh, on iOS 5. They updated to iOS 6. I rechecked everything and everything worked. So when they released iOS 7, I thought, okay, it's not going to work anymore, obviously, because what I saw is that they changed the update process. So now they sent a get request from a starting point. There is no head anymore. So there is a direct get, so I cannot manipulate the head as we did before. Is there anything different you see in this request from the previous one coming from iOS 5 and 6? Exactly. There is an if modify since header that, thanks Apple, it's telling me what is the latest version that is stored on the device. So now I can know that the latest update in your device says that it's from January 7, 2014. It's a kind of information disclosure. This can be good or bad. We're going to see that depending on the scenario. So if there is no new updates, what you are going to get is a 304 from Apple servers. Okay, 304, there is no update. If there is a new update, you are going to get, okay, that's fine, a 200, okay, with the contents of the new update, the new versions that are available. Everything works like previously, except for the head get. Again, Matrix versus Star Wars. Okay, what do we have? If we launch the Star Wars attack, same scenario as before. If we block the get, we get a, uh, an error, so basically the victim user will notice. 
But what can we do? We can send a 304 response, a non-modified response. We can do both things in reality. We can modify the get request saying the latest version I have is from the future, so I get a 304, or I can modify the get response saying it's a 304, even if the Apple servers are, are sending a 200, because remember, we are in a man in the middle scenario, okay? What about the, the okay, let me show you that very quickly, okay, through a different video. So basically, what we have here is now a iOS 7 device, same scenario as before, okay, with verb, I proxy, and all that. You see that we get a get request first saying October 22. That's the last one that the device has. And there is a new one on Apple servers. So we will get a, if I remember properly, a 200 response coming from January. There is a new update available. Okay, so we drop this one so that the device uh, cannot see it. And we launch again the Jedi attack. In this case, let me speed this up a little bit. So we go to iProxy, we launch the Jedi attack, and from there, we go through the iProxy tool. The device is going to check again if there is a new update, but we are going to reply with a 304, saying, no, there is no a new update. There's, these aren't the updates you are looking for. Star Wars attack, okay. What about the Matrix attack? Same idea. Okay, let me speed this up. We go to iProxy again. We launch the matrix attack again. Okay, and now what's going to happen? When the device goes and checks through the get request if there is a new update, what are we going to do? We are going to say, yes, of course, there is a new one, but we are going to, again, provide a plist file from the past, okay, that is associated to a previous version. And we can say, this is valid up to 2020. Again, we can say, okay, you're going to trust this file up to whatever time in the future we want. Okay, that's the, the overall idea. And uh, as you can see now, once the device has been poisoned with the freeze, basically with the uh, old PLIS file, if we remove iProxy and everything from the uh, scenario, next time the device will check for future updates, it will receive updates whose date is from the past and therefore is not going to update. So that's the, the idea. It says, no, the, the, the last one I have is from 2020. You see that there? No, the, the latest one is from January this year. So, I mean, you are, you are fine. You have the latest one. Okay? And again, you're inside the matrix there and everything has been compromised on the device. Okay, so this is this one. Let's jump into the conclusions and what is the current scenario right now, okay? So, some vulnerability details. It affects all the iOS versions from 5 since they introduced the over-the-air capabilities 5, 6, and, and 7 up to the latest one, okay? Remember that 5 was released at the end of 2011. I found that early 2012, so I have been checking for every new version that everything is working fine, that it has not been fixed, that everything is valid, okay, and collecting the PLIS files, as I mentioned before. But this kind of attack allows you very targeted attacks. Okay, you can select a specific victim, the CEO of company A, and you can say, okay, I'm going to freeze your device. Okay, I'm going to force your device to stay on the current version it is right now. And we're going to see how can we exploit that uh, afterwards, okay, for future attacks. And it's also very stealthy. So I can force your device to be freeze to the current version for two weeks, and after two weeks, everything returns back to normal. So you go in and out of the matrix very easily, manipulating the dates, which is interesting too, okay? Some limitations. If you try to update the device through iTunes, the attack doesn't work. Why? Because iTunes uses a completely different update checking mechanism. Okay? It talks to different servers, it talks through different methods that are not associated to the device. The beauty of that is that more and more Apple users are getting used to do everything wirelessly, not through the USB cable. So it increases the risk of this kind of attack. How it can be used? It can be even used outside of the security field. Okay, I remember when iOS 7 was released, a lot of people were complaining on the internet because they preferred the graphical user interface of iOS 7. You know that there was a huge change between the two. But their device saw that there was a new update and downloaded it. So you have a 16 gigs iPad and one gig 
okay, is occupied by the update that has not been applied, that you don't plan to apply it, but it's still there remaining on your memory. Okay? So people complain about that. We could use this technique to freeze your device to six. It won't see seven, and therefore, okay, we can exploit it. Okay, regarding a more significant exploitation, I can freeze your device, make it remain on the current version, and wait for vulnerabilities for the current version, such as, for example, the go-to-fail vulnerability, you probably remember from a few, a few weeks ago. Okay? Surprisingly, okay, and this is just a speculation, I notified Apple on February 6th, and on February 21st, they released the go-to-fail in a hurry. You remember they didn't release it for Mavericks. They did it on Friday night here and in Europe. Okay, very, very, very helpful for the administrators of the different uh, companies so that they can protect their users. Okay, and not for Mavericks as we mentioned. And basically, it allowed you to intercept the encrypted traffic without generating any warning, manipulating the SSL TLS traffic. We are going to see that in a second. So a bit of history for the vulnerability. We know when it was discovered, okay? I obtained a, a copy from other researchers for the update files I didn't have at that time, and then started to collect those. I notified Apple on February 6. I got the automatic response from there. We have received your submission. Then on February 14, Apple came back to me and said, hey, you mentioned that you can do that temporarily or permanently. Can you please explain how can you do that permanently? So I explained them technically how to do it. And then I received another email uh, thing, I mean, saying thanks for the clarifications. And that was all. So I was preparing my disclosure at Ruticon. And one of my, I have multiple uh, Apple devices that were victim of this attack over these two years. And one of my iPads on Saturday, March 1st, saw a new update. And I thought, oh, what, what's going on? I mean, this was a victim device. I didn't touch the device, I didn't update the firmware, but it has seen a new update. So Apple has modified something on their servers so that now devices, okay, can see the new update, okay? So they, basically, you shouldn't do that as a vendor, okay? If a researcher has notified you, not even getting a T-shirt, okay, having to build their own T-shirts, okay? And it's going to present about it, don't try to break the demo on the conferences, okay? This is something you shouldn't do. Okay, so keep calm, okay, and fuck Apple at, at that point. Okay, so what is, what, what changed and what is the status today about this vulnerability? Okay, so this is my iPad, okay, and my iPad, okay, had a new balloon there, say, eh, there is a new update. And I went there and it says, eh, 706 is available. And I said, what's going on? What had changed? So I started to research about it, and basically this is, see the code of what Apple implemented in their servers. Basically, what they did in the mesuapple.com server is if the header, if modified scenes, is missing, okay, or it's from the future, okay, because I manipulated it before to be from the future, then go to fail again. Then go to fail, okay, and what they do, they provide you their response. Say, no, there is a new update. You cannot come from the future, okay? If not, if it is from the past or current, everything works normally. So I had to modify iProxy, not to use future, future days, but to use the current date. Okay, so they limited somehow the risk, but still everything works. Remember, in iOS 6, everything works. Why? Because there, there is no header from the device indicating what is the current date, and therefore they cannot check anything. In iOS 7, however, they can. So the Star Wars attack still works. You can reply with a 304, and it works. And the Matrix attack, which is the most interesting one here, because it's the permanent one, cannot, cannot be extended to the future. Basically, what you can do is you can, see, you can say to the device, keep, or I'm going to free you on the current version, and you will remain there up to the next update. So you do a step one update. Basically, that's the idea. If you repeat the attack, you can extend that over time. But now you can extend just one, one update. So let me show you that. I, I plan to, to run a, a live demo here, but I don't have a space on the table to be able to put the camera and the devices and all that stuff. I figured out that yesterday. So instead of being partying yesterday with you, what I was doing at night is recording a new video for you. So I hope you appreciate that, okay? that involvement. 
I have. So, <laughs> just joking. You have seen that this device, let me go back here for a second, is running 704, okay? So it's in an old version. And we are going to check for updates. So it's going to see the latest one available now, which is 711. So we enable the Wi-Fi network. Let me speed that up a little bit. Okay, we go to software updates. It sends the get request. We get the reply saying the latest one is 711. It's coming from Apple servers. Okay, and it's from March, no, April 22. Okay, that's the, the next one. We drop that, it's just for you to, to look at that, and we repeat the process we did before. So basically, we are going to point barb to iProxy, we are going to launch both attacks, so you can see that in action. The first one is the Jedi attack, so the temporary one. We are going to force the device to check if there is a new update, because we are in the middle, basically we can manipulate that, we can submit a 304, as you already know, and the device thinks it's on the latest version. So let's wait for the response. Here we go. We submit that, and this one says, yeah, 704 is the latest one, although it's 711, as we know. And then, let me speed that a little bit. We launch now the matrix attack. Again, we change that to 15, okay? So we get the request for the device. It's just for you to know the new implementation, and we say the request, I mean, the, the last update I have is from the future, and you are going to see how Apple server says, no, 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 it must be current. So this is what they change, okay, with the April 22 date. And what we are going to do now is to uh, compromise the device with the, the new update. With the matrix attack, we point to iProxy again. We launch the matrix attack here. Let me speed that up for a second. We check for a new update on the iOS device. The iOS device sends the get request. And what we do is we submit back a get response that says, okay, the latest update is this one, 704, for example, and it's from now, basically June 2, yesterday, okay, 11 something, okay? So the device will take this update and will think it's the latest one, 704. So if we take a look at the PLIS file, we will see that it contains the update for 704, not the latest one, not 701, sorry, 711. So now the device thinks the latest update is 704, and the, the date that is valid for it is the current date. So till Apple releases a new update, iOS 8 or whatever it is, it will become or will be freezed into that version, okay? And you can see here how now it's checking that it has that update and that the Apple server says, no, 304. I mean, there are no new updates. So still, it's there. What can you do with this kind of, of attacks? As I mentioned, if your device is in a previous version which is vulnerable to something, what we are going to see here is man-in-the-middle proxy that implements the go-to-fail attack. So you can exploit, for example, the go-to-fail attack. So here I'm going to Google, okay? You know that Google now, even the search engine, is encrypted, so it's going to connect through, first of all, HTTP, and then it's switching to HTTPS, okay? We are going to see the lock here, as you can see, but there is no error. But I'm in the middle. I'm launching a man-in-the-middle attack based on go to fail. Any search, any interaction you will have with the target application through HTTPS will be intercepted by the attacker without the victim knowing. It's just one of the multiple vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Basically, that's, that's it. You see that I'm looking or searching for Area 41 there, okay? And here we have the Area 41 query, okay, going to the Apple servers, but encrypting through HTTPS. And the same idea, if we go to the uh, uh, account, okay? If we go to the Apple account, we enter a username and password over here to open a, a new session, authentication. We can intercept all the traffic, basically, username and password, and, and collect that. So this is what's going on. Let me speed it up. So we enter here username and password, okay? And let me show you how we can collect that through the go-to-fail attack. So it's opening a new session there. We are collecting the post request, as you can see here, okay? And inside that post request, we have the username and password, of course, in the clear, as you can see over here, okay? 
Area 41, Area 41 rocks. OK. Any vulnerability. So what is the real impact? OK. Do you remember that in Matrix, we could have glitches in the Matrix? Remember when, OK, things that show up, like, like the cat, black cat appearing two times and things like that? The same thing happens. Sometimes, during this process of research, what could happen is that the device uh, sees one, one update, and therefore, when you go to check for the updates, there are no updates. So you have the balloon there, but then you don't have updates. Th strange things like that. This is, if you didn't implement the attack properly, I discovered this kind of, of issues. So it's 2014 now. So my questions are, OK, why Apple didn't use HTTPX for the update checking process to start with? OK, interesting. Probably they put too much trust on the integrity verification process of the firmware files and didn't think anyone could manipulate the update checking process. Okay? It could be an issue of performance. Okay? They could think, OK, we are going to have a lot of people asking for the files. Let's use HTTP. But you can differentiate content, upload content, from upload checking. Okay? And secure one and not the other. That's a, an option. Okay? HTTPS in one, HTTP in the other. Okay, you can have a conspiracy, conspiracy theory, okay? I'm thinking this was made on purpose there, okay? Who knows, okay? It's open to you. If you have an MDM product, please check that your devices are running the latest version that you know that is available. Because still, as you have seen, the devices are vulnerable, okay? And obviously, we don't learn from the past. So what is the real impact, okay? The real impact is that me or anyone that knows about this vulnerability, could have exploited that vulnerability okay, to freeze devices and to exploit other vulnerabilities, others like the go to fail one that we have seen during the last two years, okay, or the almost 200 vulnerabilities we had in iOS 6, the 80 vulnerabilities we have in iOS 7, so on and so forth. Okay, lots of different options there, obviously, and jailbreaks that we have had during this two and a half year period, too. Okay? There is only one exception where you can easily detect the attack. Which one do you think it is? If someone freezes your device in iOS 6, are you going to figure out that you are not running iOS 7? Most probably, because the graphical interface completely changed. Okay? So that's the only scenario where it will be detected. Unfortunately, just to finish up, okay, this is the world we live in. Okay? We have an over-dependency on technology, and still the technology is very mature, insecure. So, I mean, it's, I cannot, cannot understand how we are still using for critical processes HTTP instead of HTTPS in devices that support a very big business model, as we have seen before. Okay? So without further ado, okay, the credits for all the people that helped me with their research. And that's all for you. So I'm open to questions you may have regarding all the research and the different tests we have seen.